Hey guys, my name is Tom and welcome to the first part of my C-Sharp networking tutorial series. In this video, we'll be setting up a TCP connection between clients and a dedicated server. I'll be building the client in Unity and the server will be a basic console app. I learned a lot about multiplayer games from Kevin Kymak, whose channel I'll link to down below. Some of the core parts of the networking solution we'll be building in this series remain unchanged from what he taught on his channel. But over the last two years, I've modified a lot of things to make it what is, in my opinion, much easier to work with as a developer. I've also added UDP support, which I'll cover in a future video. If at any point you run into issues, make sure to join my Discord server where you can ask for help. There's an invite link in the description. We'll start by setting up the server, so open up Visual Studio and create a new project. Choose the C-Sharp console app template, give it a name, and choose a save location. I'll call mine Game Server, but you can obviously name it whatever you like. You'll notice that if we run the project right now, it opens a console window which immediately closes again. For now, we'll fix this by simply adding console.read key at the bottom here. Now the window stays open until a key is pressed. We'll also quickly rename the console by setting its title property to a string of your choosing. Once again, I'll call it game server. We'll need a place to house all the server logic in, so create a class called server. At the top, add the system.net and system.net.sockets namespaces. In the server class, we'll need a public static int called max players. I'll make this a property which can only be set from within this class. Do the same for the port property and then add a public static TCP listener field. Next, we'll add a public static method called start, inside which we'll do all of the necessary setup for the server. Make sure to give it two parameters, one for the max players and one for the port number. Inside, we'll assign the parameter values to their respective properties, and then we need to initialize the TCP listener. We'll pass IP address .any as the IP, and you guessed it, our port number for the port. Then we'll call the TCP listener's start method, followed by its begin accept TCP client method. For this one, we'll pass it an async callback called TCP connect callback and null for the object state. The error that pops up now is because the callback method we gave it doesn't exist yet. We'll create that in a moment. Before we do, let's add a console.write line at the end here to let us know that the server started successfully. I'm also going to write starting server to the console up here, although that isn't really necessary. Now we'll come down here and create a private static void called TCP connect callback, and this will take in an iAsync result. In here, we'll create a local variable to store the TCP client instance returned by the TCP listener's end accept TCP client method, to which we'll pass our async result. Once a client connects, we want to make sure to continue listening for connections, so we'll call the TCP listener's begin accept TCP client method again, passing it the same values as before. At this point, we need a more permanent way to store client information, so let's create a new class and call it client. Once again, make sure to add the system.net and system.net.sockets namespaces at the top. Inside the client class, we need to store the client's ID and a reference to its TCP class, which doesn't exist yet. Below, create a public class called TCP and give it a public TCP client field. This is what will store the instance that we get in the server's connect callback. We'll also want the client's ID in here, but we can make this field private as well as read only. To assign the ID field, we'll use a constructor which takes in an int. Then we'll add a public connect method which will take in a TCP client instance. Before I forget, let's give the client class a constructor as well, inside which we'll assign the client's ID and initialize its TCP instance. Back down in the connect method, we'll assign the TCP client that's passed in to the socket field. Create a static data buffer size field which we'll set to be 4096 bytes or 4 megabytes. Then we'll assign this value to the socket's send and receive buffer sizes. We'll also need a private network stream reference and a private byte array, so create those and then set them in the connect method. I misspelled receive, so quickly fix that if you did as well. Finally, call our streams begin read method. We'll pass in our receive buffer, an offset of zero, data buffer size as the size, receive callback as the callback, and null as the object state. I'll be placing to-do comments throughout the code. Feel free to omit these, as their sole purpose is to make sure that I don't forget anything important in future videos. Now we need to create the private receive callback method, which will take in an iAsync result. In here, we'll put everything inside a try catch block so that any errors don't cause a server crash. In the catch, we'll simply write the exception to the console, and in a future video, we'll properly disconnect the client. 
In order to receive data, we need to call the streams end read method, which returns an int representing the number of bytes we read from the stream. We'll store this in a variable called byte length. Before we do anything else, we need to check if the byte length is less than or equal to zero, in which case we'll want to simply return out of the method. If we have in fact received data, we'll create a new array with a length of byte length, and then we'll copy the received bytes into this new array. After that, we need to handle the data, but we won't be doing that today. Instead, simply call stream.beginRead again with the same parameters as in our connect method to continue reading data from the stream. That's it for the client class, at least for now. Now that we have a way of storing clients, let's add a dictionary to track them back in our server class. We'll use the client's IDs as keys. We need to make sure to fill this dictionary, so let's create a private static void initialize server data method at the bottom. In here, we'll use a loop to populate our client's dictionary, starting with one as the first ID, not zero. Back in the TCP connect callback method, we need to assign our newly connected client to an ID, so we'll set up another loop, once again starting at one. Make sure to change the condition from less than to less than or equal to, which I forgot to do in initialize server data. Inside the loop, we'll check if that client instance's TCP socket is null, and if it is, that means this slot is empty, in which case we'll call its connect method passing in our newly connected TCP client instance. We'll also return out of the method to make sure the new client only takes up one open slot. If this loop executes to completion, that means the server is full, so we'll print out a message to the console. Before the loop, we'll also put a console.write line which will print out the connecting client's IP and port. Don't forget to call initialize server data in our start method. Back in the program class's main method, we can finally start the server by calling server.start and passing in a value for the max players and which port we want to listen on. During development, you can use whatever port you like, however if you plan to release your game, I recommend choosing an unused port from this Wikipedia list. I'll leave a link in the description. Lastly, run the server to see if everything works, and make sure to allow it through your firewall. Otherwise, clients won't be able to connect. That's it for the server, now let's move on to the client. Start up Unity, create a new project, and choose a save location and name. I'll call mine Game Client. We'll start by renaming the default scene to Main and creating a scripts folder. Inside, we'll create two scripts, one called Client and the other called UI Manager. Open up the client script, delete everything inside, and add the system.net and system.net.sockets namespaces at the top. We'll use a singleton implementation on the client, so we'll need a public static client field called instance. Just like on the server, we need a field to store our data buffer size, so add that as well. We also need a field for the server IP. Set that to 127.0.0.1, which is the IP for localhost. As for the port, set that to whichever port number you chose when setting up the server. Finally, we'll need a field for the local client's ID and a reference to its TCP class. We'll use Unity's awake method to initialize our singleton. First, we need to check if instance is null, in which case we'll set it to this instance of the client class. If instead instance already has a value, and it isn't this instance of the client class, we'll destroy this instance. That may be a little confusing, but basically it will ensure that only one instance of the client class ever exists. In Unity's start method, we'll create a new instance of TCP and assign it to our TCP field. Then we'll create a public connect to server method. We'll add code to this shortly. Similarly to the server, we need a TCP class with references to our TCP client instance and its network stream, as well as a byte array field. We'll also create a connect method inside which we'll initialize the TCP client and its send and receive buffer sizes. Finally, we'll initialize our receive buffer and call the sockets begin connect method, passing in the server IP and port, connect callback, and the TCP client reference. Now we'll create the connect callback method, which takes in an iasync result. Inside, we'll call the TCP client's end connect method, we'll check if we are in fact connected, and if we are, we'll assign a value to the stream field, and we'll call the begin read method. Just like its counterpart on the server, we'll pass in the receive buffer, an offset of zero, data buffer size as the size, a receive callback method, and null as the state. We'll make that method private, and it'll take an iasync result as a parameter. Since the contents of the try block are identical to the servers, we can simply copy and paste that over. Next, we'll open up the UI manager script, delete everything inside, and add the unityengine.ui namespace at the top. 
Create a public static UI manager field called instance as well as a game object reference called start menu and an input field reference called username field. Since we're using the same singleton implementation, we can copy paste the client's awake method to the UI manager. We'll also add a public connect to server method, which will be called when the player clicks the connect button. Once that's clicked, we want to hide the start menu, disable interaction with our username input field, and we want to call the client's connect to server method. In said method, we'll call tcp.connect. Make sure to save all that and then return back to Unity. In the editor, add an empty game object to the scene, call it client manager, and attach our client script to it. Next, create a canvas, call it menu, change its UI scale mode to scale with screen size, and set the reference resolution to 1920 by 1080. Add a panel object to the canvas and call it start. Attach the UI manager script to the canvas and assign the panel to the start menu field. Next, we'll add a button with a width of 300, a height of 60, and a vertical offset of negative 40. Change its text to say connect and set its font size to 50. Lastly, we'll add an onclick event and choose the UI manager's connect to server method. Now we'll create an input field with the same dimensions as the button, but with a vertical offset of positive 40 this time. Set the placeholders and the text font size to 40 and change the placeholder to say username instead of enter text. Finally, assign the input field to the UI manager's username field. Hit play and start up the server. Once the server is running, hit the connect button and you should see the connection message written to the console. If so, congratulations! You've successfully set up a connection between your server and your client. If not, double check you didn't miss anything, and if you're really stumped, feel free to join my Discord server and ask for help. The link is down below. That's it for this tutorial. If you enjoyed it and found this helpful, don't forget to smash the like button. In the next part of this series, we'll start sending data back and forth between clients and the server. So make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you're always notified when I upload another video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again next time.